And that brings me to my um, uh, last couple of sources. They're a little bit unusual, a little bit different, a little bit at the at the edge of what we normally consider as generation. Uh, even farther farther from the edge than uh, uh, captive generation. Uh, demand scheduling can be thought of as a kind of capacity. Uh, if, if we thought we could take a certain element of demand and schedule it, then we could think of adjusting demand to the available supply. And so you think about some easily adjustable components of demand, irrigation, charging electric vehicles, charging batteries. There, there are um, uh, uh, opportunities for uh, scheduling uh, pumping. There are, there are a couple of um, installations where um, large amounts of water are pumped over uh, mountains for irrigation purposes or pumped to higher elevation for irrigation purposes. Um, it's possible to actually schedule that demand and, and use it as a um, as a way of managing the balance between the, ener the generation resources we have and the amount of electricity we need to supply at a given amount of time. Uh, another form of demand scheduling is involuntary load shedding. Um, and involuntary load shedding doesn't have an explicit cost associated with it, but I think everyone realizes that load shedding has a very substantial actual cost associated with it in terms of um, the kind of changes that businesses make to their operations to accommodate the possibility of load shedding, the building of backup power supplies, and so forth. So one could think about managing demand rather than as load shedding. We could think about managing demand as obtaining demand reduction voluntarily. So we could think about having contracts with customers to reduce load at particular times. And we'll call it voluntary load shedding at a price. So now we have contracts with some of our large users that if we need to have them reduce their load in order to balance uh, the supply and demand on the grid, they'll agree to do so at a given contract price. So we can think about demand reduction as a, a, a way of balancing supply and demand. Not so much a form of supply, but uh, a way of meeting demand without increasing the amount of electricity we generate. Uh, this kind of arrangement has a low capital cost. It's just a matter of making a contract with a generator and arranging for the interruptible, uh, interruptible service. And the marginal cost can vary quite a lot, but since this is a voluntarily obtained service, then uh, only, those, only those electricity users who would find it in their interest to write such a contract, so they would be the low marginal cost reducers of their demand for electricity, they're the only ones who would be interested in signing these contracts. And there may be large reserves of demand reduction available at relatively low cost if um, electricity users had the opportunity to participate in dan demand reduction programs. With fixed tariffs, we don't expect to see response to changes in our cost of generation. But if we were to write contracts with users where their use ref more closely reflected variable cost, they could choose to reduce their demand during high cost periods, which would reduce costs for everyone in the end by reducing peak, um, peak demand costs, reduce the need to run uh, high cost uh, capacity such as combustion turbines for, uh, for high demand periods. Okay, that brings me to my very last 
uh, my very last set of uh, electricity service technologies. I won't call this generation because what I want to talk about next is storage. Um, we talked about how hydro is a form of energy storage, uh, but mass storage in the form of batteries, uh, in the form of kinetic energy, non-hydro kinetic energy, um, is maybe the next big thing in uh, electricity supply and grid management. Uh, storage is a kind of supply, uh, but it may be in the form of short-term demand reduction and daily balancing rather than any sort of baseload supply. Uh, the scale can be large or small. Um, batteries can follow load, uh, up to a point certainly. Um, and interestingly, the costs are falling very fast. Um, the cost of battery technology is following the same kind of cost reduction path that we've seen in many other new technologies. Uh, so even if we think just about uh, stand, the standard kinds of lithium ion batteries that are used in electric vehicles, their costs have fallen dramatically in the last 10 years, much like solar PV costs have fallen in the previous years. Uh, and also new storage technologies are popping up all over now and are subject to enormous investment interest. So we should expect to see considerable activity in the development of new generation resources, of new, of new storage technologies over the course of the next few years. And we need to be thinking now about how we'll effectively use those resources in the next generation of grid and generation resources. Um, another, uh, another point I want to make about storage, and this is a point I've made earlier, is that storage can substitute for transmission infrastructure. Um, we talked about how uh, uh, it's important to think about the flexibility of new generating assets in a region and how that can be substituted for tr transmission infrastructure. Um, but storage adds to the flexibility of local resources and the co adding storage to a given set of baseload power plants and renewable power plants can uh, reduce the need to upgrade uh, our expensive trans uh, transmission infrastructure. And this is uh, going to be an increasingly important consideration as the cost of, of electricity storage technologies fall. Okay, the last thing I want to talk about is a combination of things that I've talked about before, and that is distributed renewables with batteries. Uh, this is taking two of the things I've talked about before and throwing them together but it's important because the potential uh, uh, of these, this combination of resources is, is uh, as the cost of both of the contributing parts fall, is becoming greater and greater. And there's actually an element of risk to uh, uh, the development of these new resources that we need to be prepared to address. So the cost of, of both renewables and batteries are falling, and we've already talked about how these can provide some grid services. They can provide flexibility services, ancillary services, and can even substitute for the upgrading of transmission, uh, transmission infrastructure. Uh, so these resources can be used to lower the cost of electricity service to customers. One interesting uh, challenge that grid managers face now is uh, whether the availability of low-cost renewables and storage uh, might result in mass defections from the grid. So the advent of low-cost renewables and storage uh, can put a limit on the tariffs that might be charged. Um, those who pay high tariffs are, might be in a better position to self-finance uh, defecting from the grid. And so what this means is that grid managers need to find ways to include distributed 
renewables with storage into the portfolio of grid services. So that, remember, we talked earlier about making sure those offering services to the grid get compensated for the services they're offering. It's getting to the point where we need to think about distributed grid services as one of the new generation resources that we can call upon to provide services to the grid. If we are making good use of distributed renewables with storage, then we'll be compensating people for investing in these resources and maybe reducing the cost of the overall supply of electricity for everyone. So it's important that we begin to think about the engineering challenge of including distributed renewables and distributed renewables with storage into the grid services portfolio.